All right, if you will, uh, we're going to turn first to, well, let me just say this. Um, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to go through uh, some, uh, at least two thoughts, and we're going to look up all the scriptures that we can find to that. Um, and we're going to try to find the real deal with the Exodus, okay? The real deal with ex the Exodus. <clears throat> and um, so we're going to start, though, in Hebrews 11. So if you'll turn with me to Hebrews 11. And we're looking at this verse in relationship to this question. <clears throat> Why did God not slay Israel's firstborn? All right. Why did God not slay Israel's firstborn? So we're looking in Hebrews 11, verse 28. Now, there are 20 references in the book of Hebrews to the word blood. 20 references in Hebrews to the word blood. And this verse, verse 28 of chapter 11, is the only one that has reference to the Passover. And you will find a whole lot of scriptures from the time of the Exodus, which is Exodus 12, through the rest of the Old Testament and even into the New, where there are very few references to the blood in relationship to the Passover. Now that should seem strange to you, mainly because that is what everybody makes the big deal. So my, so the question was, why did God not slay Israel's firstborn? And I put down for reason number one, we would say because of the blood. We would say, Christianity would basically say that the act of putting that blood on the doorpost is the reason why God didn't slay the firstborn. All right, well, this verse mentions that, Hebrews 11, 28. Through faith he kept the Passover, and the sprinkling of blood, lest he should destroy, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. All right. So, first thing I want you to notice is the word "and" between the word Passover and the sprinkling of blood. Okay. Notice that because it didn't just say the Passover, which includes all the pieces. It's stating that the Passover is one thing and the sprinkling of blood is in conjunction with that, which is why we use a conjunction between <laughs> the two things because it's in conjunction with that, okay? <clears throat> but when you use and like that, usually it has something else it's adding that is separate from that first one in that sense. All right. So through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Um, so uh, I wrote down, what does it mean that he kept the Passover? He kept the Passover with a conjunction, and in conjunction with that, but not the Passover, he sprinkled the blood. Now, just trying to make you think, because... Uh, we'll never really discover all the things we need to unless there are certain factors in the Exodus that we can nail down in our understanding. All right? So, uh, I wrote, first it means to choose a proper, this is the, what, it mean, what does it mean to keep the Passover? First, it means to choose a proper lamb, kill it, and eat it. That came first in the sentence, the Passover. That's the Passover. That's what we understand the Passover to be. All right. So if you, um, if you look at examples of the Passover, for example, Israel, if they, if they uh, celebrated the Passover sometime during the 40 years that they were in the wilderness, there's really no place to put the blood on a doorpost. Okay. 
and I'm going to say, and I, I, I like to be challenged on this, anyone <clears throat> who can find examples of them using the blood after this first time, please tell me, because I've been looking and I can't find any. I mean, doesn't that seem strange too? I know that I've looked through the prophets and other places, and definitely they have left out the blood. Okay. So the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood was a separate thing on the first Passover. Um, so that first that that came first, the Passover, that part in the sentence and was the only part designated as the Passover. The phrase and the sprinkling of the blood is in this sentence represents an act that was not required as part of the Passover. After this first time, Israel no longer put the blood on their doorposts. So um, you see that in the feast of Passover. Um, so again, I'm open because I would like to find any references where it definitely says that. All right, so my question then becomes, and this is all so very important, not just to the Passover, but the Passover is the thing that the scriptures are constantly pointing to as this is the great, as I said last class, seminal, central place, time where they're constantly referring to sacrifice, the original sacrifice. And in most of the, well, in the Old Testament, basically, they're not going to Abraham, which is the father of all of them, but they're not talking about Abraham offering Isaac, which maybe that's not a big deal to y'all, but that was a shock to me. I was just going, you gotta be kidding me. It kind of elevated the Exodus to me, the Passover in the Exodus to me, to see that if all the prophets and all the people after that are referring to that event, then that's where we're going to find the treasure because they found it on some level. All right, so, so which is more important, the lamb or the blood? Okay. Now, this is, a, this is an important thing to stick in your memory. Which is more important, the lamb or the blood? Well, I put the lamb was before the world. Okay. Uh, the lamb was before things created, meaning that. The lamb was before the blood. The uh, lamb was before the incarnation. And I even put the lamb was before Jesus ever had blood. He was a lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. All right. So, um, uh, so. This is saying, or what, what, why are we looking at this? This is saying to us that our minds, because of religious training, automatically say it was the blood that saved them. It was the blood that did it. It was the blood that did it. And God is saying it was the lamb that did it. Okay. Okay, uh, so the question again, why did God not slay Israel's firstborn? Reason number two. He wanted to deliver Israel from bondage. Okay, is that true? Okay, so this is Exodus 3, 7. You can go there because we'll be roaming around Exodus for a little bit now. Exodus 3, 7 says this, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So he delivered his people from affliction and bondage. All right. Well, I hope everybody is remembering that we talked about two groups came out of Egypt. The firstborn, the firstborns, which is probably not the best way to say it, but it helps us to see that different from the firstborn. And the children of Israel. All right, so one of the things that is very consistent with God, and you can see it all through the scriptures, you can see, how about, how about the book of Judges? Just think of that. When his people cry unto him, 
he responds. Does that seem to be true? Okay. But it's not just when we pray or when we say, help me, help me, help me. It's when we cry out to him, cry out to him, cry out to him. And that's hard for us to cry out to him. We, again, we pray, we do the, oh, God, you know, we sell it. But we're, we, it's always, the, it almost always uses the words cry out or showing that there is a, a real cry to him and not just, well, I'm saying a prayer, so I expect you, expect you to show up. Okay. And this goes all the way through. You can find, you can find it with, with uh, Hagar and Ishmael when they were going to die. And she cried out and she called the place the, the, the place that God sees. He saw me. He saw me. Well, that's good news because I've used that a lot of times. <laughs> No, I have. I have. I, I, because I know he's that way, and I know he doesn't mind if, as long as I'm not faking it because he's not going to show up if I was faking it anyway. So I, I don't, you know, whatever's built up in me, I go, Lord, I cry out to you. And he answers. So that's just something to keep in mind. <laughs> that works for Israel, Ishmael, or or the firstborn. All right. um, reason number three, he wanted to bring them to the promised land. Now, do you agree with all these so far? And, so you, and these are all basically in the scripture, <clears throat> except the first one was questionable. Yeah. Uh, Exodus 3, 8 through 10. And I am come down to deliver them. Does that, is that significant that it says deliver them? Somebody tell me why that's significant. Glory to God. Because the firstborn was redeemed and Israel was just delivered from bondage. Glory to God. That, if that sticks in you, it's going to open up so much what the scriptures say that you'll always say, well, uh, Israel was redeemed. When they weren't, the firstborn was redeemed from death, and Israel was delivered from bondage. And to this day, Israel is delivered from bondage, but they are not redeemed. All right. So, I'm come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry, the cry of the children of Israel is come up unto me. There's another scripture verifying. I'm telling you, use it. He, he won't be offended. He's more offended at the fact that we don't cry out to him. We just go through our little religious whatever we do and think that he's going to go, oh, this is great. Yeah, I really like it when you act religious. <laughs> and then we always, because we do, then we go, well, why didn't God help me? It was, I was in desperate situation. Behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come up to me, and I have also seen the oppression. And many, 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 many more than I can say, times when he does show up, there has been oppression. I mean, I don't have the time to show it to you everywhere, but I am telling you, and, and just so you know, when he showed up, for Hagar, you should see why he showed up. I've seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So what's he going to do? He's going to deliver them. He's going to bring forth my people, not my firstborn. This is the issue. This is the way God thinks. 
God thinks in two veins. One, his people, and two, his firstborn son. And you make the decision on where you want to be found. But that's how it is. That's, that's, that's our God. That's our God. If you, you know, the only way to, to say we know God is to, is to learn him in all of these things. And to know how he is. And he's single-minded in that sense for his son. He'll do every, he'll, he'll wipe out uh, the firstborn of all Egypt, including cattle and animals and everything else. He'll do that. He'll, he'll move the whole world so that Mary can bring forth her firstborn son, which happened to be the Lord's, and wrap him in swaddling clothes and move everything so that she, He's down there in Bethlehem. He didn't do it because Caesar wanted to count heads. And of course, everybody's griping. Why are we having to move? Why are we having to go to the home of our, the city of our home and all of this stuff? Why, why, why? And if you knew him, you'd go, it's got something to do with the firstborn. There's no question about it. <clears throat> All right, so I wrote two things. Uh, he wanted to deliver them from bondage and affliction, and he wanted to bring them into the land of promise. All right, so um, I'm going to skip a little part here because I don't really see how much time we got. Well, then I'll just read this three minutes and ten seconds. Notice, okay, so what we just read, notice several verses down this. Notice that Moses and all the elders are going to come to Pharaoh, and they're going to say something completely different. He just said, God said, I will deliver them, and I am going to take you to the land of promise, didn't he? Now listen to this, verse 18. Uh, and this is the Lord speaking about the elders and everyone. And they shall hearken to thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. And ye shall say unto them, The Lord God of the Hebrews, which I dig, the Lord God of the Hebrews, hath met with us, and now let us go, we beseech thee, Three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. He just said, I'm going to take you all the way to the promised land. And so he's telling the hotel Pharaoh, well, we're just going to be gone three days. It's not that big a deal. You know. So I wrote just a few verses up. He explained that he was delivering the children of Israel from Egypt and taking them to the promised land. But they tell Pharaoh they only want to go a three-day journey into the wilderness to sacrifice to their God. Notice, too, that throughout, they only mention Israel as a nation being dealt with and that they will sacrifice to their God. Because this is important on reason number four here, all right? Um, but in Exodus 4, 21, 22, of course, um, he says, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord. So now we're on reason number three. He redeemed the firstborn from death so he could, so the firstborn could go to his father. My son. That's not... God, that's my, that's the father. My son have I called out of Egypt. Let my son go, even my firstborn son. All right. So some are going to the promised land. Some are going to the father. Now this gets exciting as we build on this. This is just the beginning. You know, there may be only one person jumping and shouting right now. <laughs> but it really, this is all important to where we're going. And, and, you know, it's building blocks because, you know, because it's going to answer all of Genesis. You said, I know you're saying, I know you're, what you're thinking. And I'm going to have a blast just starting with Genesis. 
Okay. I'm just telling you, this is so big and so fun once you get into it because you'll have eyes. Amen. You'll go, oh, that's why it says this. And God, that's the first one. This is what's on his heart, but he's taking care of this. And after, when it was all said and done, what was the big deal about Israel and going to the land and, and being his people anyway? Because Jesus came out from the Jews. Same story. It's always going to be you're of real value when you bring forth the firstborn. Okay. What are you saying, Brother Randy? Am I not of value? No, you're not. <laughs> you know, settle it now. And it'll save a lot of hurt and pain and crying in the future, except for when you're crying out to him. All right. So let's see. I know I must be out of time. So, uh, yeah, that's good enough. Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, let my son go that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Is he serious? Is he serious about his first morning? We need to get off one track and we need to get on another track. And we need to find out this didn't just happen in the New Testament, that God, you know, just kind of decided Jesus is going to be the thing. It's always been in his heart, but it's not Jesus in, in Israel. It is Jesus, period. Now, if he's in anybody in Israel, good. If he's in anybody in the New Testament, good. But the thing that makes a difference is that's what he's looking for. That's what he's looking for. All right, so let's take a break and we'll come back snortly. <laughs> <laughs>